How's it going everyone? JP Bernejo coming to you from Miami. I wanted to make this quick intro to let you guys know that as of February 1st, 2018, JP Traders has launched a cryptocurrency branch. So now we're not only helping people make money with Forex, but also in the cryptocurrency space with Bitcoin and with all these different altcoins. Now on this webinar, you're going to learn what's currently happening with Bitcoin, uh, what's happening in the cryptocurrency space in regards to, you know, is Bitcoin crashing? Is it going all the way down to zero? Is it going to 50,000, 100,000? And this webinar is jam packed with information. So if you're a brand new beginner or if you're just someone who has been looking to learn more about uh, this crazy cryptocurrency space, right? You're going to learn so much much about it on this webinar. Our webinars are held by high six figure and seven figure cryptocurrency earners, which are some of the mentors that work here for the JP Traders Academy. And we're very excited to share this publicly with you guys because normally this is only for our students, but we've decided to bring this out publicly. Our mission here at JP Traders is to help out the masses to un fully understand how the cryptocurrency market works and how you can properly invest in it. So what we've decided to do is that every single Sunday night, we're gonna be hosting a live webinar training at 9 p.m. Um, Eastern time, 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, we're going to be releasing a link where you'll be able to join. The only way that you can get this link so you can join us on this live webinar training is if you either add me on Facebook um, at facebook.com slash JP941, or if you add me on Instagram at JP underscore Berdejo, I'll put all that information here in the description below and make sure you not only follow me or send me a friend request, but you message me so I can actually send you the webinar link. So with that being said, let's get started with this webinar. All right, guys, well, welcome to the crypto webinar. Uh, my topic right now, we're going over the uh, current market update, any news, what to expect, and uh, should we still be in Bitcoin, where should we be, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So I really want to let everybody know, and what everyone's been asking is, why is the market so volatile right now? What's really going on? Is Bitcoin going to zero? What's happening? So I want to sum it up the best I can for you, show you some examples. We'll look at the chart and then talk about any news that's coming out. So five things that are really going on over the last week that has really caused a lot of this volatility that we see the up and down uh, one of the first things is the regulatory actions SEC is getting involved UK has put out some new laws and just to really sum it up the big debate is regarding if Bitcoin and cryptocurrency is considered a security if it's considered property or is it considered a commodity and all of these different divisions, the Commodity Board, the SEC Board, and the IRS have all been battling pretty much all week to make a decision on what it is. All this regulatory news scares a lot of people, and a lot of people have exited the market due to that. Um, they have came to a consensus. We did determine that it is going to be considered a commodity. Uh, that's why they're moving forward with a lot of the commodity indexes, very similar to how gold, oil, all those commodities are traded on the futures market. That is how Bitcoin is gonna be treated in class going forward. So because of that news, there's been a lot of kind of people scared to get in, get out. That's one thing that's really happened. The second thing is the Mt. Gox. Um, we talked about it last week in 2014, one of the biggest exchanges. You can kind of compare it to almost Coinbase, how big this exchange was back in 2014. Um, there was some internal I'd say issues going on and ultimately it got hacked. It may have been a responsible party involved. We're not going to dive into it. But anyway, they were ordered to pay back a lot of the Bitcoin and a lot of the money that was lost due to their internal affairs. And what's happened is the treasury or the treasurer that were holding on to this Bitcoin was ordered to pay them back within the next six to 12 months. So they started liquidating a lot of Bitcoin recently to pay back a lot of those people that lost money. Uh, so them liquidating thousands and thousands of Bitcoin into the market has caused a lot of that volatility. Other things in the news right now, Google, uh, Facebook, and other websites are banning cryptocurrency related ads. And in my eyes, a lot of people are getting scared about this, but I think it's a good thing. A lot of the ads out there are for the next topic called scam ICOs or initial coin offerings. A lot of them are coins that may have potential, but they do not have a working product 
They may not have a great team, and they're just starting to fundraise money, but they put all these big numbers on them. They come out with a great name, a great project, and they pump it up and say, this coin is going to be the next Bitcoin, and they get a lot of investors in. And eventually, the coin may not be released, it may not come out, or maybe it might fall to zero. So to really safeguard a lot of the people out there, um, Google and Facebook, they don't want to be involved in these ICOs. So they've banned all ads for right now. I guarantee you, I've talked to some insiders at Google, and they're working on ways to really understand the crypto market industry and decipher what is crypto related for the good and what is for the bad. And eventually they are going to allow cryptocurrency back onto Google ads and Facebook once they go through a rigorous process to determine if it's a true and legit coin or a legit project. And I think that is just phenomenal because that's gonna save a lot of people from getting scammed on these initial coin offerings. And the last thing is the market manipulation. And I spoke about this earlier today and over the last few weeks is Goldman Sachs purchased Poloniex, one of the second and third largest cryptocurrency exchanges. And what I feel they're doing is they feel like there's a lot of manipulation in the market that they're bringing all these prices down. So when they revamp Poloniex, they're even coming out from what I heard with an app that is gonna outbeat Coinbase. It's gonna allow you to buy Ethereum Classic, all the top coins that are on Coinbase, plus more cryptocurrency all in your app with US dollars and make it easy for the average consumer. And that's what Goldman Sachs and Poloniex are working on. So before they come out with that app, I guarantee you they wanna have these low prices so they can buy as much as they can. So when they release this app, they have the liquidity to get in and out of the market and suffice those trades. If you're not familiar with what liquidity is, is any exchange has to have a lot of that token in it backing before they allow people to buy and sell. They can't just write out an IOU for Bitcoin. They actually have to own a lot of that Bitcoin when they're doing those trades. So those exchanges have to acquire a lot of that. And from what I'm seeing, is it looks like Goldman Sachs and Poloniex are acquiring a lot of that now. So when they release this app, and right now it's potentially the next three to four months is what they're talking, that they'll have all that ready to go full forward with this app. So we've seen a good amount of market capitalization loss over the last few weeks. We were at over a $470 billion market cap. We're about a 330 billion now. So we've lost about a hundred billion or more, more than a hundred billion in market cap. But I guarantee you that is due to a lot of this market manipulation. And I wanted to show you guys a couple articles that I found and dive a little deeper into it. All right, guys. So what we've seen over the last 24 hours, we're actually up over 5%. And we've seen a great increase uh, since our low of about 7,200. Um, in this chart, I just wanted to bring up the guys seeing the 24-hour change of over 5%. Um, I was able to do some trading this morning. We talked about it earlier. So I hope you got in on a couple of these positions. Uh, but I wanted to bring up the chart, actually, that we posted in our Facebook group. So you guys see, and I said this was the only chart that really mattered at the time. And as you see, we're still intact, and we're following this wedge pattern right now. And this morning, we had a dip down to really the low 7,200 area and bounced right off of that area. What's interesting I want to show you at the bottom is very undervalued. This is the RSI, or Relative Strength Index. And I'm going to bring it back just a little further in time and show you at the bottom anything over, come on. You see this purple area, that's kind of the trend where we're in a safe zone on the bottom. Anything above this is where we're overextended or overbought. And you'll see uh, kind of December, the later part of December, we became in that overbought stage. That's when we had that parabolic move. That's when, if you're watching the RSI, which a lot of people, really either don't understand or don't follow, you would know we're in that overbought category and you would not be buying. You would be selling in the overbought territory. And same thing with the other end. When we're below the 30% on the RSI, which happened in the late February, or I'm sorry, early February, uh, we dipped below 30%. Right after that, we had a big run up 
from about 6,000 all the way to 11,000. And we came back close almost this morning to touching that 30% RSI. So if you're in the market right now, one of the things to consider is you never want to sell when you're in this 40 or 30% RSI category. That is oversold. That is when we've, all the selling has been done. We're getting ready to flip sides. And you can add this to your trading view chart by at the top, there's a section to add different trends and you just type in RSI and it'll bring up this uh, plugin to add on the bottom. Very good tool. If you ever feel yourself wanting to sell or wanting to buy, always take a glance and see what, what territory we're in. If we're in that overbought area, way up past 70%, that's really you're in that FOMO stage. If you're missing out on you're trying to buy into that upward trend, where you really want to be buying on these dips that are below 30% RSI. So I want to show you guys that. Another really interesting thing that's coming on right now is on Google Trends, you see when Bitcoin was the highest, back when it was $20,000, um, that was when we had its peak. It was almost 100% market saturation, and everybody was searching for it on Google. Well, we have since then came back down to almost where we were uh, prior to the bull run at about a 25 to 30% saturation on Google searches. So that really leads me to believe that the, the Bitcoin mania has slowed down. We've kind of gotten out of a lot of the weak hands. A lot of people that were interested in Bitcoin before may not be interested anymore. So we're kind of leveling out. And that's what we want to see. This is the time to be buying. And when we reach that high market saturation of everyone's searching, everyone wants to get in, and we're above the 70 RSI, then we know we're a little overbought and time to scale out. Um, last thing I want to talk about for the market update, um, Intel and a lot of other companies are jumping on the wagon for blockchain. They see the value for it. They actually develop teams. And speaking of teams, going off topic, I want to talk about Coinbase. They just hired the merger and acquisition manager from LinkedIn to work for them now. So think about that. The merger and acquisition department is now headed by the same person that was running LinkedIn's merger and acquisition. So that leads me to believe that Coinbase is really looking to purchase and buy out other companies and expand and grow if they just hired a new merger and acquisition employee that's going to lead that entire department. And if I recall properly, they're looking at employing about 14 team members on that force just to look at purchases and buyouts. So really awesome future coming ahead. Intel's jumping on board, IBM, everybody's getting involved in blockchain. I would not uh, want to be left behind at this stage now and regret not buying down the road. So follow a lot of things that we're talking about. Take the time to learn. And I'll bring up that chart one more time to make sure you guys have a holistic view of what's happening. You know, my really prediction is we'll still have a little bit more volatility maybe for the next few weeks. And... Typically what happens with the Elliott wave theory and some of the other theories that are out there is we test the uptrend line at least three times before we break out. So I would really consider that we've had one test, we've had two tests, we might have one more test, and then we could have a breakout to the upside. Uh, that really jumps over the, uh, the market update. I'm going to pass it over to Cameron to talk about some of our calls, and then I'm excited to share a new coin of the week with you guys. All right, awesome. Um, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do is uh, get the uh, the bad news out of the way. Um, as my parents used to say, do you wanna hear the good news or the bad news first? Um, so we did uh, actually uh, tap out of the end cash trade that we had. We can see here, uh, we had drawn a level at the top here uh, in, in you know, kind of created a wedge here. However, we did break out, so we're gonna save um, you know, some time here and, and just get out right now. Okay. So we may re-enter this. We're going to keep a close eye on that. But, uh, for as now, um, we have actually, uh, tapped out of that one. So, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and go into the other two calls that we did make one of them being BTC. So, um, you know, whenever the market is acting really, really crazy, the one thing that you want to keep an eye on is uh, BTC. So as you can see, we had created a, a trade alert right here. If we go back, you can see 
our uh, first trade alert was, um, you know, somewhere up here. We hit the sweet spot at that little heart there. And now we're in the second buying phase. So as you can see, uh, I'm going to hit play here. And you can see that our buy hit. We said to buy at 7,600. Um, so we bought in. Like we said, we had this nice big spike up here. And, and that's where we're really looking. So you can see this is on a smaller time frame um, than what Kryptonic just showed you. Um, but we are looking to, uh, you know, take some profit one up here. And to be honest with you, I would I would assume this is probably going to be uh, part of the, you know, the top of the wedge there. Um, so, you know, we may take that profit up there at the first take profit and maybe look at it getting back down um, into this wedge as well. Um, could do something like that. Come back down. Like you said, you know, we did one, two, three tests and then we're looking to maybe either. Uh, re-enter or if we just continue up after you know clicking this take profit one we'll just look at take profit two and then we'll we'll do some other calls there um, so that is BTC round two I call it um, in the group uh, the next one I want to take a look at was ZEC we had made this call uh, a, a while ago as well and let's see how we're doing in that particular coin right now um, so if I hit play here this is beautiful because um, we have actually hit uh, the buy level, which is right down here. And you can see how this has respected it so well. Um, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. My computer doesn't want to zoom right now. But you can see that um, we have definitely respected that area right there. And I think it's just a, a lovely call. We will keep an eye on this. And I actually looked back at like way previous uh, to put in this call. So you can see we have a max pain level down here, but we are actually in this trade um, at, at the buy level one. So that kind of concludes that. I had actually one more coin that I want to look back on. It was the last previous coin um, that we had called out as well. And uh, that one was Verge. Now, we had put a mark on here to buy at a certain level um, if we held above this line here. Um, so you can see we, we drew a line across here. It's the magenta line. So if I hit play here, you can see that we actually did not hold above this level. So we're still in a holding pattern. We may actually get in there. It just depends on what we do here. We had a max pain level down below that. So um, that's where we just say, you know, call the trade invalid. But when we made this call, it did not hold. So we actually did not enter this trade yet. Uh, so we'll keep you abreast on that as well. Hey, I know we had some uh, questions out there. Uh, I definitely want to jump into uh, Coin of the Week real quick before we hit the Q&A. Um, I, I did hear about a couple questions, I think, from outside the group. But let me just share the uh, quick Coin of the Week, if you don't mind, Cameron. Oh, yeah, I went off topic. See, I, I was getting some questions, and then, yeah, of course. We're, we always do. All whatever. right. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and take over real quick. All right, so we haven't put out official call yet, um, but I wanted to uh, bring up something very interesting that I've been watching for a little while, and it was overhyped for a good amount of time. And same thing with Bitcoin. Now the hype has kind of died down on this coin. This is IOTA. IOTA for a while was overshilled, and it was really in that, that overbought category, over 70% RSI, but it's really came back down. And this is just the chart that we're looking at. We've recently seen a lot of volume the last two days. And what I found interesting is this coin has held up at least its USD value for the last about three or four days. Even though we've seen Bitcoin, a lot of other altcoins falling, this has been maintaining about a dollar ten average in USD uh, for the last four or five days, which is impressive when we've seen Ripple, Verge, a lot of the other coins going down in value. Um, so I like that this is holding value and holding strong. And from looking at the technology behind it, I'm just really excited. And I think, you know, if you can get this in the low $1 range, $1.10 or even around $1, I think it's a great long-term opportunity. Um, I picked up a little bit this morning, but I'm not going to do a full trade until we really see an uptrend break. And we'll keep you guys updated on that. But I wanted to bring up a little information about it to, to show you guys um, right now today it's up almost 10% um, so about a dollar 23 if we look at the historical data um, the close for the last looks like maybe four days or so has been in that dollar 10 area like I mentioned where 
on the other uh, coins, we've seen a, a big drop off. Way back in the day, I don't know if we can even go back further, this coin had a high of in the high of threes or four dollars. So that shows you right now we have a 4x opportunity if we can get into that low one dollar range and it even goes back to its previous highs. Um, and that's just a place to even start. Let me bring up the chart and show you guys. Yeah, we were uh, right up here in, around that December altcoin uh, pump. It was $4.34. So we definitely have a 4x potential. I do like that this coin is in the top 10 already for market cap. So fairly safe that uh, where it's at right now is going to hold strong and not see too big of the swings and too big of volatility. Where if you find a coin that, you know, right now there's 1,564 coins. If you pick coin number 1,564, guarantee you're going to see some massive volatility. Could be towards the upside or the downside, but that's a little too much risk for my taste. And majority of what we're teaching, we try to avoid that high of a risk. But when you're in the top 10 coins, you normally don't see as big of price fluctuations and you kind of have a, a better stability for the long haul. Very similar to if you're into the stock market, if you think about buying Apple stock, it's fairly stable, grows over time, it's a good investment. Compared to maybe jumping on a brand new company, maybe like Fitbit or um, maybe Square, something that's a new technology that's not really widely adopted yet, and it's still very volatile, and over the next five years, Fitbit and those other uh, companies can really take off or they can flop. Um, so that's why I like to kind of stay in the top 10 if it's going to be a really big holding. So you're probably wondering what does IOTA do? Uh, I'm going to go into just a short little synopsis. I'm not going to dive too deep. But what's really interesting about IOTA is their uh, blockchain. They're, they're actually not using blockchain. They're using a feature uh, called the Tangle Network. And uh, this took years to develop, and they've developed it. And what I like is that there is no transaction fees. Uh, the Tangled Network is different than, than blockchain, and it doesn't use miners. It doesn't use proof of work, proof of stake. It actually is very similar to the proof of stake where the current holders of IOTA, by having them on the network, it generates uh, more transaction speed. So really, the more people that own IOTA, you're not staking them, you don't have to put them up or anywhere. Just by owning that coin, you become part of that tangled chain. And what's interesting is the more people that get added onto there, instead of a scalability issue that we've seen with blockchain where it slows down because there's more miners or there's more um, transactions for the miners to mine, where the more people on the Tangled network, the faster it gets, which is a really cool concept. So they're never going to have a scalability issue because the more ownership out there, the faster this can run. And because it's peer-to-peer -peer ownership and you're not having to stake or create that node, uh, there's no transaction fees. So it is zero money uh, to transfer IOTA. Um, now, your exchange, maybe like Bittrex or somebody else may charge a transfer fee. That's up to them. But in the protocol, there is no transaction fees, where typically if you send Ethereum or another coin, you might pay gas or something else to conduct that transfer for the miners. This, there's no one that takes that fee. So no transaction fees is really interesting. There's no scalability issue because it's peer-to-peer. -peer. They have a feature um, that allows offline transactions where if uh, the the person's coins that are sending it is not part of the network, not on the network. It can save all that data, and when it's connected at a later time, it updates the Tangled network. Um, so if a business loses power or something, it can still operate on the IOTA network, and when it becomes back online, it can transfer all that data. Um, a quick comparison uh, to Bitcoin. Um, you'll see, you know, obviously Bitcoin uses the blockchain network. IOTA does not. Transaction fees. When each of them started, uh, Bitcoin started in 2009. IOTA is fairly recent within the last two years. In the release method, they had a crowd sale where they raised over 500000 in Bitcoin. They didn't do any mining or pre-mining. It was a true just funding campaign to get them up and going. Um, there is a picture. I'll see if I can find it. Um, how IOTA works. It's 
shows the scalability. See if I can find it. Maybe a little lower here. Here we go. This is what I was looking for. So this gives an example of a lot of Diota users out there and how transactions are sent and validated, how it goes between multiple ones. So very similar to mining, um, but GPUs have to use electricity and power uh, to figure out the, the equation where this, the IOTAs themselves figure it out throughout the network. So pretty cool how the concept is built. Um, they've been talking about working with a lot of other companies. Um, there are endless possibilities of what it can do. And just one example that they were coming out with was for self-driving cars to partner with Apple and any of the companies that are coming out with these and to create a payment system that's part of a smart contract with zero fees where a smart car can know when it's running out of power because it's the protocol built into the IOTA Tangle network and it can tell them where the nearest IOTA Tangle charging station is and it'll direct that self-driving car to that payment or that charging station and that charging station will send an IOTA request through the Tangle network to the vehicle for payment. And this is all without anybody. This is all just smart contracts. And the vehicle will go ahead and send the proper amount of IOTA to the charging station, and the charging station will in turn start charging that vehicle. Once it's done, it disconnects from their Tangle network and continues on. So all done without people, without anything, it's all part of a smart contract built into this. So that's one idea. Think of the possibilities that this can do out in the future if this is just one implication where you can build these smart applications onto it and that can connect with zero fees and you built in the programming to tell it what to do. So super cool. Right now it's, like I said, a little over a dollar. Um, I definitely think that $4 range is in play. Some people are putting between 5 and $10 on there, which would be at least a 10x return where you can't get that there anywhere else. Uh, so we're going to be putting a call out there soon. I would put this on your watch list. Um, get ready to start out with maybe a 25% position and slowly start building that position. This is going to be something else that's going to be a longer hold. Because it's in the top 10, it's not something that's going to skyrocket tomorrow. It's going to be a slow growth, kind of like a Google or Amazon, uh, if you own their stock, where it kind of just grows over time. So really interesting. Uh, thanks for uh, checking out the coin of the week. Pass it over to uh, Cameron to go over any uh, questions that we had from in the group or outside the group. Awesome. Yeah, actually, um, I, I picked the two top questions uh, for this week. Um, the first one I'll have you do, and then the second one I'm going to go ahead and answer. Uh, the first one, uh, because you love BTC so much, is uh, Christina asked, uh, she's been seeing news about uh, Bitcoin hitting $100,000. Is that possible? Follow-up question is... Yeah. When could we see that by? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Christina. Um, really hard to predict right now with so much volatility on there. Um, I do think it is possible, but not in the short term. And it also depends on uh, regulations, depends on people picking it up and kind of where it goes from there. I would say, you know, we kind of want to look for the short term. You can't really um jump that high i'd like to see the 20,000 to 35,000 be our next realistic target um and really if you know anything about economics we're talking about supply and demand there's a limited amount of bitcoin on there uh, so we know the supply is not infinite we know there's a, a a finite number of supply out there it's just the demand is going to be really what predicts that price and the more adoption, the easier it becomes, and the more places that accept Bitcoin, that's going to create more demand that we're going to see that price increase. Uh, so to answer, Christina, your question, do I think we can hit 100000 I definitely think it is possible. Uh, time frame, it could be a few years out. Back when Bitcoin was, you know, $100, people never thought it would hit 1000 And when we were at $1,000, I was part of the game and I remember when people said Bitcoin would never exceed the price of gold. The gold was about fourteen to fifteen hundred dollars an ounce, and that was a big turn of events when Bitcoin actually exceeded the price of one ounce of physical gold. And from there, naysayers kept saying it's never going to reach five thousand, never going to reach ten. 
And after we broke through 10 cent, people said it's never reached 20. And we've kind of crushed through every barrier that's been put out there. So I don't think 50,000 to 100,000 is out of the question. Now, time frame may not be what most people can withstand, which would be a few years out. Uh, we definitely have a lot of volatility to go through ahead where we could go back to 20,000, retrace the 15, then see 30, come back down to 20, then go to 45, then to 30. So we're always going to have these really kind of boom and bust where it skyrockets and come back down to more equal level. So a realistic time frame, maybe two years out. And I shared this quote with Cameron earlier, and I encourage you to look it up and dive more into it. But really, it's around the foundation that the market can remain irrational a lot longer than the average can remain rational. So what that means is the market can really have these up and down swings where you can't even predict it. It's so irrational, you don't even know what to do. And the really good traders can remain rational throughout that period, but the market is intended to be so irrational that even the best traders can't withstand it and they exit out of the positions and that's when it really starts to skyrocket. So we don't know how long this irrational stage could last, but it's guaranteed to outlast where the majority of people can stay rational throughout it. Now, I know I'm going to be one of those persons that really stay throughout it, and I can remain rational because I've seen these ups and down cycles, and I know it's going to keep doing this. Um, so, Christina, great question. I do think we can see 100,000, but I would not plan on it in 2018, maybe not even 2019 as well. Um, I would say when we have the next Bitcoin halving, which is at the end of 2019 going into 2020, I think that's when if we cut the mining reward and the supply in half, that we can really see a twofold return. So hypothetically, if we could say maybe by end of 2018, 2019, we're in that 30 to 40 range, and then we go through the halving when we're at that same price point, that's when we can see a surge to that 100,000 range. Um, but if I were if I were you, you know, Christina, I would slowly start buying over time. Think of it as a long term investment plan um, that's going to fund your future where if you contribute $50 here or there and really hold with that long term vision, it can really pay off as it's done for the people that bought Bitcoin at $100, people that bought Bitcoin at 1000 2000 3000 all those people that bought it around then have been holding it and they're seeing great returns. So. Don't get scared by the short-term volatility. We were just down at 7,000, 6,000 a few weeks ago, and we had a big run up to 11. Now we're back there again, and we're going to keep seeing those swings. Um, so I'd have a short-term vision. You know, Keep an eye on the 12,000 range and the 20,000 range, but no, maybe over the long term, a couple of years, we could see that. Awesome. Thank you for answering that. Um, I think we were just talking about that on a conference call earlier, actually, is, uh, you know, I personally, my, my rule of thumb is taking one third and sticking it into cold storage. So when you stick something into cold storage, it's not like it's, you know, staring you in the face. It's kind of just in a in a wallet that you forgot about, you know, you, uh, you know, put on some pants from 10 years ago and you find a hundred dollar bill um, and, and then it it makes money. So yeah, um, that's a great analogy. You, I actually saw another analogy about Bitcoin and the, and the way that it's it's going is when you think about computer chips and how computer chips were actually manufactured, um, they exponentially rose at about the same level as Bitcoin has. So, you know, you think about when computers came out and how many years later Bitcoin comes out and then how Bitcoin has gone from pennies on the dollar up to $20,000. And now we're just seeing, you know, these micro um, retracements. I mean, to, to some it's not micro, but I think in the long term scheme of things, these are micro, uh, you know, retracements if I'm not, you know, out of line. Um, so I did get another question here. Um, Jeff asked, what is the Lightning Network? I've heard of this lately. I will try to do my best. I haven't done a ton of research on this, but I'll go ahead and take over um, my screen here. So if we look at the Wikipedia, the Lightning Network is essentially a second layer 
payment that operates on top of the blockchain. So you could you could think of uh, you know we have uh, smart contracts, things like Ethereum would be using this. Uh, so enables instant transactions between participating nodes uh, that have been touted as a solution for Bitcoin scalability problem. So or problem rather. So we think about Bitcoin and we we think about how sometimes we hear about these slow transactions. However, this network would would kind of be a network on top of a network. So to dive a little bit deeper, uh, let me give you an example. So here's how it works. So first two parties who wish to transact with each other set up a multi-sig wallet, which requires more than one signature to enact a transaction. The wallet ho holds the same amount of Bitcoin. The wallet addresses is then saved to the Bitcoin blockchain. This sets up a payment channel. So all of a sudden you've opened up this payment channel. The, the two parties, while this payment channel is open, can conduct an unlimited amount of transactions without ever touching the information stored on the blockchain, which I think is very interesting because this would allow some type of, uh, you know, anonymous transactions to happen. So you could do all these transactions while the, the node is open. And then once those transactions are completed, both parties sign and an update to the balance sheet is reflected. So think about that. And then when the two parties are done, they close out the channel. And then all of a sudden, the resulting balance is registered on the blockchain. But but the blockchain, uh, you know, which holds every single transaction, doesn't on the Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network would take care of those micro transactions. I almost think of it kind of like as a Visa thing. You know, um, you know, you own a small shop and you do all these transactions as opposed to reporting every single transaction. It's kind of like the old school where you do all the transactions. And then at the end of the day, all you do is send the lump sum, which I think is super interesting. Um, so, I, you know, I can see this definitely being uh, the future there. So I hope that answers that. that. This is just the short answer to the Lightning Network because there's tons of other uh, you know, things out there we could go into, but you see it's be being developed for light, uh, Litecoin, Stellar, Zcash, Ether, Ripple, you know, there's some other ones out there, uh, but these are, these are the main ones, uh, Bitcoin even joining in, joining in as well. So with that, um, is there any other quick questions before we go ahead and close it out? Seeing everybody shake their head no. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and end this session. I appreciate you being part of the JP Traders group and being active with us. We will see you next Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, where we go over the market analysis, uh, all of our trades, and coin of the week in Q&A. So uh, thank you, and everybody have a great evening.